apparently we have an actual tornado watch today. Growing up, there's been plenty of tornado warnings and tornado watches, but I don't think I've ever had to actually take shelter from one before. Hopefully, this is not any different. You know, this watch is an interesting device because I don't like wearing it most of the time. But of course I wear it every day when I go for a run and then I can listen to stuff wirelessly. It's one of those things that having it has been almost an entirely positive experience. I just look forward to going for my run every single day, even if it's in my very poorly sewn together pants. <laughs> This is so funny. I think that's probably not gonna hold. <laughs> it is raining slightly, but you know, I really wanna get out there. I wanna get out and move, man. I haven't moved in so long. You know, this is probably not an insignificant amount of rain, but it's pretty warm outside. It's warm out, right? Yeah, it's like 70 degrees. We're just gonna go for it. Why not? Okay, not too bad. We can manage this. First run in about two weeks. I'm gonna cramp already. It feels pretty good overall. You ever see like those really dedicated older people who are out there running, basically just shuffling? That's my running today. Just a nice little shuffle. Well, now the rain is picking up a little bit. It's a, a mile. Let's get like at least another half mile in. Okay, 23 minutes, 23 seconds, 1.82 miles. Nice, easy run today. I am soaking wet. You know, this is pretty interesting. This is my estimated VO2 max using my smartwatch, which I first got in July of 2019. Now, if you just scroll through, it's kind of hovered around 52. And then last year I got really high, got up to 55.1 in August of 2022. There's a huge dip right here. And the only major thing that happened was I got COVID right there. October of 2022. Now in the past four years where my smartwatch has been giving me an estimated VO2 max based on my heart rate, I've been sick many times and I've had to stop exercising and start it back up again. But the only time my estimated VO2 max has dropped this far down was right after COVID. And it's kind of very slowly recovering, but that's crazy. Almost four years of data and it was on a pretty straight line and it dropped precipitously after COVID. That shows you what a beast that disease was. Is, is. The other day I mentioned a blog called kotkey.org. How I separate work from life. If I let it, every part of my life could be part of my job. But slicing and dicing everything up for consumption all the time, meta experiencing absolutely everything, that's no way to live. Back in the day, you saw journalers and bloggers burn out from sharing too much of themselves. Now you see it happening with YouTubers, TikTokers, and influencers. I did not know that that happened to bloggers also. You clearly have seen it play out with YouTube, TikTok, and the like. You just can't live your life and then also document all of it at the same time. It's What's really interesting is that this is kind of like a external example of how you can't overthink things. If you're always thinking about what you're doing, you end up just second guessing everything and just eventually start to drive yourself crazy. There's a limit to how much like self-reflection we can actually handle. We're like, oh God, I can't, I can't do it. Anyways, I thought that was interesting that even people who are just writing about their lives could start to overshare and feel like they were extending themselves too far. You'd think that writing would have enough of a barrier that it would be kind of impersonal to just share things in writing form, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, anyways, that's gonna do it for today's vlog. I'll see you in the next one right now.
So a little while back, Brian linked us to this video on YouTube of this guy named GX Ace wearing one of our t-shirts in his YouTube video. And I was like, I know the name GX Ace. I see him in the chat all the time. Well, he came over yesterday and we nerded out about cameras for like eight hours. We were like two little kids just had our toys strewn all over the house. There was cameras everywhere here, all in the other room, all out here. It is just like They're kids really playing with toys. On random shelves in your room. <laughs> like I thought that was your camera. <laughs> you could have easily stolen that and I wouldn't have noticed. This is mine now. <laughs> oh, it was a good time, good times. I've never met somebody who is more into cameras than I am. And it was so much fun. The internet has made it so that you can find people who are as into the stuff that you are. Also, he let me borrow his Panasonic S5 II. Like our top three most viewed videos on the Adventure Archive channel were all shot with the Panasonic GH5. Now, I have not shot on Panasonic cameras in a while ever since the current camera I'm using, the Sony A7S III came out. But this S5 is very interesting for a couple of reasons, and one of them is it's supposed to have a really good stabilizer. This is the Sony A7S III, the camera I currently use. We're gonna try to get an apples to apples comparison. I set a custom white balance. We are at 20 millimeters, f3.5, 4K, 24 frames per second. And just get an idea of what they both look like on their standard picture profiles with the only thing changed being in-camera sharpening moved all the way down. And now we are on the Panasonic S5 II. Uh, for my eye, they look pretty similar, except this is quite a bit more contrasty. The image quality though has long since not been my main concern. All the new cameras now, they all look pretty much universally amazing. It's a lot of the usability and feature set that I'm looking for, but we'll talk about that in a second. So the Sony a7S III is a $3,500 camera that is very expensive, but it basically only really has one flaw, which is that its stabilizer is not very strong. So if you do handheld shots like this, it looks okay, it's passable. I've done plenty of videos with a stabilizer like this and I can live with it. Let's do the same thing we just did with active stabilizer. We now have active stabilization turned on. We are at 20 millimeters on the lens, but with active stabilization, it crops in slightly. So you're maybe looking at like a 24 millimeter. I'm not actually sure, but it does look a little bit more stable and it's actually pretty respectable. Uh, we are now on the Panasonic S5 II with just the standard stabilizer. We're at 20 millimeters and there is no crop being applied because it's not digital stabilization. One thing I forgot to mention is that sometimes these stabilizers, you have to walk in one direction for a little bit before the stabilizer can kind of catch up. So if at the beginning of each of these test clips, it looked a little bit shaky and it got more stable, that might be why. Okay, so from here on out, I'm gonna to refer to these cameras as the Panasonic and the Sony. The Panasonic indeed has a better stabilizer. It also looks sharper. And I'm not sure if that's just because there is more in-camera sharpening being applied, even though I've turned it all the way down, or if it's because it has a 24 megapixel sensor versus a 12 megapixel sensor. That being said, I like the way the Sony looks better, even if it doesn't look as sharp like the kind of softness of it actually looks a little bit nicer. I also like the way the colors look better on the Sony. Now for a lot of people that won't matter because they do all sorts of color stuff in post. But if you're somebody like me who shoots on the standard picture profile and you essentially want the final image in your recording, that does make a difference. Now, as I said earlier, the Sony costs $3,500. The Panasonic only costs $2,000. That's almost half the price. If you were a budget conscious camera user, then that would actually really be in the equation. But for me, all of these cameras are kind of in the realm of I can afford it and I use it for my job, that the price doesn't make a difference for me. I know that sounds ridiculous, but the price really doesn't matter if you're making money off of them. So my comparing these two cameras as if they're peers, that's why. Now what's been missing from these Panasonic cameras is that they never had good autofocus. This S5 II is the first one that uses a technology called phase detect autofocus, and it finally has good autofocus. Man, you can just put your face in there, it locks on. I haven't adjusted any of the settings or the speed or responsiveness or anything, but that's very nice. Oh man. But enough talking about specs. Let's go out and shoot a video in the way that I would actually shoot a video and see how it works. Actually, one more neat party trick of this camera is that it can shoot at 5.9K, which is cool because that means you can crop in a little bit without any quality loss. But let's go to my typical camera testing park and let's just film like I would normally film for a solo video.
Wow, you know, this stabilizer seems really, really good. Okay, check this out. Right here, there's a plant on the ground. Let's get a shot of it. Let's use something called Boost IS, where it tries to lock off the stabilizer to make it look like a tripod shot. That was one of my favorite features about the last Panasonic camera I had. Hopefully, it's as good in this camera. That's the thing with these cameras, they can look really great on paper, but until you've actually used them and gotten some experience with them, you don't know what all the downsides are and what like all the little quirks are that could be deal breakers in actual practice. Well, I can tell you what's a deal breaker right now. It's how bright it is outside. I gotta get some sunglasses. Here you can see the stabilizer, some full on running. It actually seems pretty decent. <laughs> Now they seem to have changed the way that they handle manual focusing since the last time I've used a Panasonic camera. And it's kind of a big change. And I found very few people online who are also annoyed about this. And it's kind of hard to explain. Let's go back and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It used to be that you used to be able to move this little focusing box. And then whenever you lifted your finger, it would automatically focus. But now nothing happens. You have to actually press this AF button and then it'll focus. So you move it, lift your finger, then press AF. Whereas in the past, you, you just move the box, lift it, and it immediately focuses. One of the great things about talking with GX Ace yesterday was that I could talk about cameras to my heart's content, and he was just as excited about it as I was. I'm always very worried when I talk about cameras on the vlog that I'm just boring everybody because not everybody's into cameras and the minutia of it the same way. So I try to give you a view of it where you can understand why I care about it even if you don't actually use the cameras. But I don't know if I'm always actually successful at that. Anyways, I'm gonna use this for the next couple of videos and then you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make a comparison review of the Sony a7S III and the Panasonic S5 II. I did the same thing for the GH5 and the a7S II, and I got 250,000 views, so I'm gonna do that again. Not just because I want the views, which I do. <laughs> I also feel like I have a lot of insight to get because I've used this camera extensively and I've filmed a lot of videos. So I know what you might actually wanna be looking out for that wouldn't be immediately apparent just from the spec sheets. Anyways though, thank you very much for watching today's vlog. That's it for this one. I will see you in the next one. The internet has made it so that you can find the weird people like you who are as into the same things, who are as into, the internet has made it so you can find the same weird people who are as into the stuff, what? Am I saying that right? What? The internet has made it so that you can find people who are as into the stuff that you're into as you are. What?